Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly David. I'm a director for the Foundation for Angelman Syndrome Therapeutics. We appreciate you tuning into this webinar. Just to let you know, it will be recorded for replay at cureangelman.org forward slash webinar. And now to Amanda. Hi, guys. It's nice to be with you this evening. My name is Amanda Moore, and I'm with the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. And now to Noah. Hi, my name is Noah Firestone. I'm the chair of FAST Canada. Nice to be here. And this is Krista. Hi there, my name is Krista Graham. I'm a director with Canadian Angelman Syndrome Society, and I'm thrilled to be here this evening. Also joining us this evening is Dr. Scott Sturmat. He's the Chief Medical Officer of Genetics Biotherapeutics. Good evening, it's great to be here. Dr. Sturmat, we are all very excited to hear more updates regarding the KIK-AS trial, so I'll jump right into the first question. Um, can you please let us know when the other sites will be up and running? The first site at Rush University is now open and actively recruiting patients. The other sites have to continue with their process of getting RB approval and contracts approval. And so we'll see that happening anywhere between the next four to 10 weeks. We will continue to update the patient organizations as well update the clinicaltrials.gov as well as the KIK-AS website as sites become activated. Thank you so much. Can you also let me know if my child can participate if they are not deletion positive? The clinical trial is for patients with the deletion genotype. Um, we need to do additional work to understand the biochemistry, the dosing with GTX-102 in deletion so we can do the proper dose, proper study design in patients with the non-deletion genotype. Uh, genetics intent is to study non deletion genotype as fast as we can. Thank you. I know a lot of our angels use CBD as a therapy. Do they have to be off the CBD in order to participate? You know, CBT uh, is not an exclusion. It's not prohibited in the study. So they can certainly be on it. We just ask that all their antileptic medications are stable for the month prior to screening. Can you tell us why the study is estimated to take about almost two years to complete, but results are available uh, much before that, between three and six months? And can you also tell us if the study will move faster if results are positive? Um, will this initial findings be shared earlier? Yeah. This clinical trial is enrolling 20 patients, and it's enrolling them in five dose cohorts. That means five gr different groups of patients. And each group has to be dosed before we can move to the next dose. So we have to get two doses in the first group. We check the data, and then we can enroll the next uh, dose group. And so it's a sequential, somewhat staggered enrollment. Um, 
not all patients will come in on the on the first day. In fact, we're keeping them separate um, just so we can understand if there's any safety issues. And that's part and parcel of what you do in a phase one trial. As soon as we get the trial completed, uh, we will share the results with the community. Thank you. Um, when GTX 102 was tested in animal models of Angelman syndrome, what kinds of improvements were seen in terms of the neurological symptoms associated with the condition? Mm -hmm. GTX 102 was not tested in uh, the mice models for efficacy. The mouse and the human gene um, aren't similar enough for the drug to work in rodents. Uh, it is similar, in fact, homologous um, to monkey genes, and there we've tested it for safety. But there's not really a monkey gene, a monkey model of um, efficacy. So we've tested it in mice and a monkey for safety, but there's no monkey model to test it for efficacy. So how will the first 20 be selected? So we know the criteria, but basically what I would like to know is how can um, our, our, my child be a part of this experience? And if my angel meets all the criteria, how can I make sure he gets the best chance of becoming a for sure candidate? Mm -hmm. The protocol uh, enrolls only 20 patients. Um, these patients have to meet the inclusion exclusion criteria, and that is a decision done by the study site investigator. So they evaluate the patient, look at the protocol, look at the, the totality of whether the patient would be a good fit for the study. Genetics doesn't have a role in um, selecting patients for the trial. That is strictly done by the site physician. Thanks. So speaking to criteria again, as for qualifications, if my son's using a walker and walking, holding both hands kind of assisted by an adult, does that qualify for the mobility requirements for the clinical trials? Yes, that does qualify. Uh, the protocol mobility requirements is that they're either independently ambulatory, uh, they use an assist device, or with a hand assist uh, from a parent or caregiver. Can you tell us how scoliosis will play into the skeletal criteria? So if the child can still fulfill the ambulatory requirement, will it be an exclusionary factor due to the method needed to administer the GTX 102? So scoliosis is not an exclusion to getting into the clinical trial. Um, the investigator has to assess whether they can do a lumbar puncture and whether that's possible, uh, and that's strictly up to the investigator. Uh, so, like I said, it's not an exclusion from the protocol. So if a child has scoliosis, they can certainly come into the study, and that decision is going to be made by the uh, uh, study site investigator. And continuing with questions about exclusion criteria, regarding infections as an exclusionary criteria, to what level of infection does that include? And if they catch an illness or a virus um, while they're in the trial, how will that be handled? Infections are an exclusion up front because that's standard. You don't want somebody to have another illness or something to confound the results initially in the study when they get the first dose. But during the study, if they get a cold or they get the flu, that's fine. That doesn't uh, kick them out of the study. Um, they continue can continue to get dosing. So how will the recruitment process work? Um, and what if I don't live in proximity to one of the study sites? The kick AS study requires frequent study visits. In fact, at, at most of the studies in the middle are every two weeks. So there's not a uh, protocol requirement that the patient live close to the study site. That's the decision that's made uh, by the study site investigator and the parent. Uh, so the study site investigator has to make sure that, that uh, for safety reasons, uh, for assessment reasons, that patients are close by or relatively close or can get in for evaluations. So in the United States, uh, we're not accepting international patients uh, into the U.S. site. And for Canada, uh, not accepting patients from outside of Canada for the Canadian site. As for older Angelman patients, is it possible for them to participate in the trial? And if so, how? The clinical trial is set up with a specific age range, uh, trying to keep patients similar uh, for analysis of, of efficacy. Uh, so at this stage, 
of the clinical trial and clinical development is just the four to 17 year olds. Can you tell, tell us a little more about the side effects of the drug? Um, is it long lasting in the system or are there multiple treatments required over a lifetime? Can you tell us if it puts any stress on the organs or liver or any of the other organs? Yes. So the, the question is, what is the toxicity profile of the ASO, the antisense oligonucleotide GTX-102? It hasn't been tested in humans, so we don't know. Uh, we know from other antisense oligonucleotides certain class effects uh, that we're worried about or we're concerned about. Um, it's turned out for other uh, ASOs when they're administered intrathecally, uh, they actually look um, very well tolerated, but we don't know exactly what will happen with this particular molecule, and that's why we're going slow in terms of development. Um, we'll certainly uh, test the patients and we'll know, and the investigators will certainly share this information from what, what the animal studies, what were done, and what we know from the class effect of ASOs in general. Thank you. And, and, and so when I'm, I mean, they share it, they'll share it with you when you come to talk to them during the clinical trial. And it's also in the informed consent. Okay, thank you for clarifying. If the trial is successful and is then opened up for individuals to receive the treatment, will the method of administration be the same um, through the spinal column? Yeah, so this is a, a large molecule, so it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So it will always have to be given uh, through a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. Um, and it'll have to be a lifelong therapy because it's not a gene therapy. You're not, you know, altering the gene or the under uh, the underlying broken gene, if you would. Uh, so you're turning on the parents, uh, the father's gene. So you're going to have to continuously uh, give the drug. We don't know how frequently. That's part of the reason for the clinical trial right now. This phase one will understand the pharmacokinetics, how long the drug lasts, and so that'll help tell us how long we have to get it into the future. You, I mean, Dr. how frequently. You'll have to give it lifelong, but what this data will help us understand is how frequently going on into the future. Thank you. Um, these are all the questions that we have for you this evening. Is there anything additional that we didn't cover that you'd like to add? Well, I'd just like to say that we will continue to update the uh, patient uh, communities. We'll update clinicaltrial.gov as well as the kick -AS website, and we expect to have another uh, webinar uh, once all the patients are enrolled. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. And I'd like to thank the community for tuning in and staying engaged with us throughout this process. Thank you.